Okay, as part of the OCR A2 biology course, you should be studying epistasis. If you've been reading your textbook, you would have come across already recessive epistasis, where the two recessive, or the homozygous recessive alleles, affect the expression of another gene on a completely different chromosome, and dominant epistasis, where just one dominant allele of a gene on one chromosome can affect the expression of another dominant allele of another gene on a different chromosome. In this example, I want to talk to you about complementary apistasis. I'm going to go through the examples that are already in your textbook, sweet peas and chickens, the Coleman chickens. Um, so if you read your textbook, watch the video, fill in the handout if you're in my class, I would have given you the handout. Um, pause the handout when you need to think about things, replay it if you need to listen to things again. So epistasis and sweet peas. An experiment done by Bateson and Punnett, two geneticists, was when they crossed what they thought to be two pure breeding white sweet peas. And they were really surprised in the F1 offspring, they got 100% purple flowered sweet peas. So this characteristic wasn't even in the phenotype of the parents at all. So that surprised them. When they uh, crossed the F1 generation, they continued to get purple flowered sweet peas and they also obtained once again white flowered sweet peas but in a particular ratio which they didn't expect which was nine to seven so this is not your typical Mendelian genetics so they thought of a three to one ratio the explanation for this is epistasis um, so I want to talk to you about the science behind what happened here then we'll go through the genetics of it all so initial colored sweet peas which are white that's their default color if you have a particular gene which we'll call a and a particular allele dominant will code for an enzyme the recessive allele does not so if you've got the a you get the expression of this gene and an enzyme now that enzyme will affect the biochemistry of this flower and give you an intermediate product in this particular example it's colorless I'm following the example that's in your OCR textbook you might find other examples where it's described as a red flower, but for the point of OCR textbook, we'll just stick with colorless, or it'll appear white still. But if you have a present, uh, if you have the presence of another gene in the dominant form, we'll call this allele B. So if you've got the dominant B, you get another expression of an enzyme, which will result in purple color. Now. If you have a flower which has this dominant B, but it doesn't have the dominant A, you won't get to that stage, you won't get purple, because you wouldn't have got to the intermediate product in the first place. Likewise, the presence of dominant A without the dominant B, you won't get the final colour of purple. So this is how the two alleles complement each other. So this is complementary epistasis. Let's look at this genetically. So what they uh, realized was that the genotypes of the two white flowers that they bred together were big A, big A, little b, little b, and little a, little a, big b, big b. So neither ones could have been purple because they had neither a big A or a big b together. When you work out the gametes, well, in both cases, well, sorry, in one case it's gonna be big A, little b, in the other case it's gonna be little a, big b and pop these into a Punnett square. Um, just pause the video, work out the genotypes, and then play the video to see if we've got them correct. So you should found that they are 100% genotype big A, little a, big B, little b. And because they both, all of these have a big A and a big B, you'll get 100% purple flowers. So both enzymes are being expressed now. When they crossed this F1 to get the F2, work out the gametes first. For both of them, you're going to have a big A and a big B, a big A, a little b, a little a, big b, and a little a, little b. And that's for both of them. Pop those into your Punnett square and start working out the genotypes of all of these. So pause the video, work out the genotypes, and check your answers. So the genotypes are as follows. Now underneath each one, just write down the phenotype. Now remember, if there's a presence of at least one big A 
and one big B should be purple. If not, white. So pause the video, check it. Okay, here comes the phenotypes. And if you count them up, you've got a nine to seven ratio. Right, let's now look at the example of chickens or chicken combs in which you see in your textbook. So epistasis, complementary, epi complementary epistasis again, of chicken combs. Right, what are the chicken combs? Well, they're the, they're the structures on top of the heads. And you can see they all come in different shapes. And the shapes are as follows. <laughs> There's rose shape. <laughs> Pea shape. <laughs> Single shape. <laughs> and walnut. The genotype, or the alleles that result in these different shape chicken combs, are as follows. So just the presence of these genes at different loci will result in the following genotype. So for walnut, you need to have at least a dominant R and a dominant P. For rows, if there's homozygous recessive for P, and you've got the dominant R, you'll get the rows. To have a P-shaped comb, you just need one dominant allele for the P. And if you are a homozygous recessive for both genes at these different loci, you'll get the single-shaped comb. Go back and look at the pictures if you need to and then we look at the genotypes. So, let's look at this example. A walnut chicken, heterozygous for both genes. It's crossed with a walnut chicken, also heterozygous for both genes. Can you remember what their genotypes will be? Okay, look, you should have at least a big R and a big P. And because it's heterozygous, we can only have the one. So big R, little r, big P, little p. What are the gametes? Write those out. So you should have big R, big P, big R, little p, little r, big p, little r, little p, for both of them. And then pop these into a Punnett square. Right, so work out the genotypes of this generation. Okay, here you come. Now, I hope you noted down what the genotypes result in, in terms of the phenotype. Go back and have a look if you haven't written that down. But from now on, please fill in the phenotypes. And they're coming up on the screen now. So don't forget, if you've got at least a big R and a big P, you're going to get walnut. So the next one should be walnut. Now go back and look what happens when you've got at least one big R, but you haven't got a big P. Rose. Next one. Walnut. Next one, there's a big R but no big P. Rose, let's look at the next ones. Okay, this one here, we've got no big R, but we have a big P. We've got two big P's, homozygous big P. Go back and have a look what you think that should be. It's P. Next one, just one single P. P again. Right, work out the next row. You've got a big R and a big P, therefore, walnut. You've got a big R, but no big P, rose. 
no big R, one big P. P. And then we've got the homozygous recessives. No big P, no big R. Last phenotype remaining, single. In this case, you actually go back to a characteristic 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. So sometimes in complementary epistasis, you will get this typical ratio again. So what's happened here? Default phenotype, single. If you've got the allele P, you'll get the P-shaped cone. And if you've also got there the allele big R, you'll go to walnut. If the allele R is present, but you haven't got the allele big P, you'll go to rose. But if you have then got the allele big P present, it's to walnut. Simple as that. So the way to remember it, if you've got the P, you get the P. If you get the R, you get the rose. If you get both, you've got walnut. They're both complementary in each other in terms of epistasis to give this phenotype walnut.